more on the shadow stuff. Uh, last time I, last couple of times I talked a little bit about my Hollow Anthroposophy material, which had two essays, one which, which was on um, Rudolf Steiner's lecture cycles and the problems of cognition. The uh, musings on the epistemological swampland and the anthroposophical movement. Okay. And the other one was the anthroposophical society is it a living social form. And these are important questions, you know. They're not uh, simple. They're not easy to answer. They require some thoughtfulness. And if someone just reacts to them, you know, finding them stated somewhere and then goes, oh my, you know, that's really, I don't like that, so I'm going to hide my head in the sand and pretend that nobody ever raised these questions. Not good. Not if you want to practice real anthroposophy. And what makes something real anthroposophy? Well, the driver for the truth. That's the thing. You gotta want to know what the truth was. You, that's got to be like at the top of why you're doing what you're doing, okay? So, I'm gonna pause here a second. I gotta make an adjustment. And I think it's useful to understand that when I got into this question of the epistemological swampland of the anthroposophical society, I didn't do it because I was looking to make trouble. In fact, I had been going to anthroposophical meetings since 1979, and I didn't write this until 1997. So you're looking at something that kind of stewed at me for for 20 years. And, you know, like most people, when I entered into the Anthroposophical Society, I had this idea. Ah, these are really cool people. They study Rudolf Steiner. I'm going to learn a lot here, you know. And a lot of things I did, I imitated. I thought I was being an anthroposophist by doing what other people were doing. Now, at the same time, you know, I won't go into the basis for this, but I had a predilection which put me on the philosophy of freedom path. And one of the interesting things about that is instead of going through the, through the sense world to get to spiritual experience, you enter immediately into the spiritual world and you start to have spiritual experience in the nature of the, your struggles to, to produce organic and pure thinking. You know? You're in the spiritual and soul world when you turn around inside yourself and begin to practice scientific introspection of your own mind because that's the spiritual world and its manifestation in you. That's it. That's the gateway. That's the first place everything happens. Now, I didn't fully understand that because I hadn't read widely, read, read widely enough in Rudolf Steiner to have all this stuff. And I sort of assumed other people were doing it, you know, and, of course, for reasons that were good instinctive choices on my part, I wasn't as attractive to some of the things that other people were doing. You know, so I would go to meetings, and I would go to meetings, and I would go to meetings, and at the same time I'm trying to figure out this philosophy of freedom stuff, and I begin to discover things about the nature of thinking. And I began to realize that, uh, let's see how to put this, that one can think consciously and have an idea, a precise idea of what you're doing when you're thinking. You're thinking on purpose. You're not just sort of thinking accidentally. And one of the things you do is, is you discover that what uh, some people call discursive thinking, that's where the where we use our, our spirit uses our inner voice and speaks into the soul and the you know, the example we have is the, the woman in her kitchen yelling to the kids being rambunctious in the living room, stop making my all that noise, I can't hear myself think. And that's where ordinary people are. That's where ordinary thinking is, this discursive thinking. But when you do the Steiner thing, you turn around and you start to look at that, and you look at that objectively. Now, he puts you in a particular place to start in the philosophy of freedom. He says, you know, well, let's think about desire. Let's think about whether we can will what we want or whether we're stuck with this desire because that was a real problem in the 19th century field of epistemology the philosophers understood that this was a bottleneck you know there was a sense that people were determined by their desires they had no control over it. we talked about this a little bit ago and we talked about the lower chakras and the train and the, all of that stuff right 
So 19th century philosophers understood that, and this young man, Rudolf Steiner, wanders into there, and he reads all this stuff. And But he has a different orientation because he's very awake inside himself, and he realizes, well, that's not precisely correct. you know. And then he does his thing. He practices scientific introspection. And uh, you can read in my book, American Anthroposophy, a description of his path. But let's put it this way. His path, his personal path, was not the path that people follow when they follow knowledge of higher worlds. You want to follow where Steiner went, you go theory of knowledge and truth and knowledge and the philosophy of freedom, because that's where Steiner went. And that's why he wrote those things in the beginning. Okay. So anyway, so I'm kind of waking up in my mind, and I'm participating in all these study groups, and I'm watching people think, and they start to do things that don't make a lot of sense to me. And what's one of the main things that they do, and which is why I called it an epistemological swampland? Well, you get in a, in a study group, and the next thing you know, people are talking about Michael's intentions. Or they're having an argument about whether or not this or that folk spirit is involved in this or that event in the world history. You know, and they're looking at world history, and they use all these anthroposophical ideas that Steiner gave, and, and you listen to it after a while, and you realize that they're not thinking very precisely and exactly. And to a certain extent, they're not thinking at all because they don't know, they haven't learned through scientific inspection of their introspection of their own mind how it is that we, in fact, form concepts. Because when you do that, it's all transparent. It's like you, you wake up and you realize that when you form a concept, you do very specific things. And these very specific things can be kind of sloppy, which I call associative and comparative thinking in my various writings. Or they can be very awake and intentional and understand that it's possible to be sloppy and therefore make mistakes in your thinking, the epistemological swampland. Well, what does that mean? Well, epistemology is the theory of knowledge. That's what they call it in the in you know, formal philosophy, and for a long time that's what I talked about when I talked about Steiner's first three books. I talked about them as epistemological. I changed the way I write about it now for complicated reasons. I'm not going to get into that. I just could refine the way I express myself about it. But the fact is, is that you can sit in a study group and you can watch people not think very deliberately, and they seem to make certain kinds of mistakes. And The main thing is they're talking about something that they've never experienced. Now Steiner makes very clear in, in Theory of Knowledge, he talks about experience and thought, and then when he does the same thing in the Philosophy of Freedom, he talks about concept and percept. Now you've got to have both of those if you're going to have knowledge. You have to have concept and percept. Well, when somebody's sitting in the study group and they're talking about Christ this, and Michael this, and folk spirits this, they don't have the percepts. They don't have the experiences. They've never been there, done that, which Steiner did. All they have is what they built up out of reading a text. Now, we've run on a little bit. I'm going to pause and I'm going to come back again because this is worth going into. This is very basic stuff, but if you want to do real anthroposophy, you have to understand this very basic stuff. <laughs>